You might have heard about the whales that have been turning up dead on the coast of New Jersey and Maryland in the wake of seismic surveys that are being conducted as a precursor to offshore wind farm construction. Ten dead whales so far, all turning up dead after the survey process began. Are seismic activities for offshore wind development playing a role in these deaths, or is it pure coincidence? I did a video covering the issue as best as I understood it last week, and you may have seen it, but I had a couple of glaring mistakes that I need to correct. So I'm going to do that here, and in the process, take another stab at making my case. But in general, for details from eyewitnesses about the individual whales that have been dying, you can check out this Facebook group. First off, I was wrong about the air guns. The surveys being conducted ahead of the whales beaching themselves in and around New Jersey were not using the full-size air guns like the ones I used footage of as an example. I really thought seismic survey by definition involved the air guns, but apparently not. There are smaller tools than the air guns that can be used, with catchy names like chirpers, sparkers, and boomers. And while that may sound like a bad morning DJ comedy duo, Boomer and the Spark, is the actual name of these alternatives to air guns. The Wikipedia page for a seismic source provides a little more info on the distinctions here. However, the difference between the air guns and a sparker slash boomer setup seems to be more a difference of degree than a difference of type. The operative principle behind the air guns is still at play. The blasts just don't travel as far as they would coming from air guns. And since the deceased whales certainly could have been at or near the surface at the time wind surveys were being conducted using sparkers and boomers, it's still perfectly reasonable to consider their capacity for impacting the hearing of these whales. And it's not just a question of permanently deafening the whales. Even temporarily deafening them could be just as catastrophic. A temporarily deaf whale might still very well beach itself out of disorientation or be susceptible to a ship strike it could otherwise avoid. And certainly any necropsy needs to examine the inner ears of these whales for any signs at all of a deafening scenario. And speaking of necropsies, that brings us to my other mistake. I thought that letters of authorization were required for examiners to do in-depth examinations like taking tissue samples, and I was wrong. Any member of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network is authorized to do whatever they can. Now when you hear what it turns out the letter of authorization is really required for, you might flip your lid. But to set up that point, I need to clarify this background. National Marine Fishery Service designates three types of marine mammal necropsies. We've got Level A, Level B, and Level C. Level A is the most basic level of data, and it seems that Level B and Level C necropsies are increasingly detailed. I can't state much more authoritatively about that because the agency doesn't provide a straightforward and precise definition of Level B and Level C data, but rather some examples. I'll just read the Fed's own words on this. Level A data is basic minimum data to be collected. Corresponds to the information required on these stranding forms. Collection of Level A data is mandatory for all members of the network. This information is not considered proprietary and will be available to the public upon written request to National Marine Fishery Service's Regional Stranding Coordinator. These data will be released provided that the requester describes the intended use of the data and agrees to provide credit to the network and National Marine Fishery Service in any publications. Whether or not a necropsy is conducted is considered Level A data but the results of the necropsy and any further information or not. Okay, remember that. Whether or not there was even a necropsy counts as level A data, but the results of that necropsy are not level A. Okay, level B data is supplemental data to the level A data that includes additional information about the stranding event and life history data. Examples of these types of data include weather and tide conditions, Offshore human, predator, prey activity, morphometrics, pre-stranding, stranding, rehabilitation behavior, stranding and rehabilitation health assessments, and life history samples, teeth, jaw, status of reproductive organs, stomach and intestinal contents. That would be level B, all of those things. Level C data is 
detailed data and results from tissues collected and analyzed for histopathology, toxicology, microbiology, virology, parasitology, etc. And also, no standardized forms have been developed for level B or level C data. One thing I think is safe to say is that the details on the condition of the inner ear or any other signs that seismic-induced deafness, whether permanent or temporary, would have played into a whale's death is not getting picked up in level A data. And level B and C data is actually not required to even be collected, rather strongly encouraged. So the whole situation with whale deaths centered around New Jersey hinges on level B and C findings. Again, level A necropsy details are not going to include any smoking gun that would link dead whales to seismic activity, if such a smoking gun exists. Examination results that would incriminate or exonerate seismic activity is going to either wind up with either a level B or level C classification. And as you saw back on the level A stuff, if we, if we provide a written request to National Marine Fisheries Service asking for specific level A data, it may be released to us provided that the requester describes the intended use of the data and agrees to provide them credit in publications and all that. I don't know if this means that they're going to evaluate our use and if they determine that our use is not sufficiently in line with the agency's values that they're just gonna withhold the information. Like, I don't know if they're making judgments like that, selecting who may or may not get access to level A data. It certainly seems that National Marine Fisheries Service withholding the data from us if they don't deem us to be, you know, worthy recipients of it is on the table, I guess. But if you write to them and they determine your purposes sufficiently count as research or education, they may authorize you to view level A data from necropsies. But if what you're wondering about is potential evidence that would link whale deaths to the seismic activity for wind farm pre-construction, level A isn't going to help you unless the beached whale scribbled its dying words in the sand beside it. No, the nitty-gritty details that link a whale's cause of death to seismic activity could only either be level B or level C. Well, guess what? Level B and level C necropsy results are proprietary, and none of us are permitted to review it, ever. The only way that anyone not employed by National Marine Fisheries Service or moving within the esteemed circles of favored ENGOs will ever be allowed to see any info from a whale necropsy that's classified as level B or C is in the event of a federal investigation. Then, and only then, is there a chance of level B or level C whale necropsy data being released to the unwashed masses. But until then, that data is locked away. When the rules for level A, B, and C necropsies were being adopted, some public commenters expressed concern that the identities of individuals conducting the necropsies should be protected in cases where their determination on cause of death could be, quote, contentious. I think we can understand that up to a point, but I can't for the life of me think of a reasonable explanation for why all of the details about dead whales, be it level A, B, or C data, are not available to the taxpayers in a publicly accessible government database of some sort, with the names and details about the examiners themselves redacted, of course. And a similar scenario almost seems to be referenced in this particular comment from the agency, saying that anything that they do release to the public would have examiner names redacted. And yet, I don't know how to reconcile that statement with the affirmation that Level B and C data is proprietary and short of a federal investigation is not going to be released to any of us anyways. The information that would be the most relevant to the question of whether or not the Fed's mission to fill the ocean with wind farms is a whale safe operation or not, that's under lock and key. Why? What you hiding in there? Why are Level B and Level C necropsy results concealed behind that firewall? So necropsies are being done, there's not any waiting period on that, and I'm guessing it's totally possible that all of the people conducting those necropsies are total pros, doing what they do because they care about marine mammals and doing it well. But the findings of their work are shielded from public scrutiny. 
At best, if Noah Fisheries smiles upon us, we may be permitted to view certain cursory level A data if they decide to authorize that. But why is it that some of the most vital information, the key data that would put to rest questions about the impact of seismic surveys, why is that hidden from us in all circumstances short of federal investigation? Shouldn't the public have access to it? And there are certainly more questions that come to mind. I mean, without forms for data collection, what exactly is the protocol on doing a level B or level C necropsy? And while the individuals who are the boots on the ground when a dead whale is discovered might be employees of the organizations in the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, or volunteers, or even unpaid interns, once they do their work and submit it to National Marine Fisheries Service, Level B and C data becomes the property of the particular marine mammal stranding partner who the examiner was retained by. Okay, let's consider the hypothetical situation where an examiner conducted a necropsy for a marine mammal stranding partner that has some high-level activists in leadership from the ban all vertical lines crowd. For instance, let's use the New England Aquarium, just as an example. Even if we have the most above-board examiner doing a necropsy, what's to stop someone with considerable position and authority like an Amy Knowlton from tweaking some of the subjective parts of the necropsy, or withholding damning level B or C data at the request of an offshore wind sponsor once that data is locked into its now confidential state as private property of that NGO? These are the kinds of things that I think of, and in the environment we're in, I do think occurrences like this are at least a risk. And let's not forget, Noah moved at lightning speed to defend the offshore wind industry from scrutiny last week. They've made their stance clear. They are answering questions about the seismic surveys impacting whales with an unequivocal no. And that is a subject we're going to get into more in the next video. But I just want to close with this. If NOAA Fisheries wants to help clear up what everyone's concerned about, a basic starting point might be answering this question on your FAQ sheet. Question. If the activities required for developing offshore wind energy end up being proven to be causing whale deaths, would your agency put a stop to offshore wind development? I'd like a yes or no answer to that. And I hope some of you can bombard them with this too, so that it does become a frequently asked question. I'd like to know if they will acknowledge any level of collateral damage at which point they would shut down offshore wind farms on the basis of environmental harms. In summary, the information that would link whale deaths to offshore wind surveys is encouraged but not required to be collected, and if collected, is proprietary and only is required to be released under a federal investigation. When it comes to the deaths of these whales, I guess a humpback or pilot whale just doesn't matter as much as the elusive North Atlantic right whale does, right? ENGOs like Oceana and New England Aquarium, whose whale activism I find totally disingenuous, they haven't found the mounting whale body count around New Jersey to be worth commenting on at all so far. Personally, I find it very curious that as soon as this story of all these whale deaths started gaining traction, all of the ENGOs, like New England Aquarium, like Oceana, they all of a sudden started promoting an incredibly conveniently timed discovery of an entangled right whale off the coast of North Carolina. The timing reminds me of the last time this happened, when schools and businesses across the whole state of Maine planned a Friday this last fall for everyone to wear red in support of lobstermen and in recognition of the fact that they have not been the ones harming whales. What happened in the 24 hours leading up to that huge grassroots effort? The whale NGOs rushed out for the 99th time to snap more pics of their old standby snow cone and flood the news media with a bunch of hype about how snow cones going to bite the dust any minute to imply that that's proof that the lobstermen must be at fault. Of course, lobstering could have been shut down in the US 10 years ago and that wouldn't have prevented Snow Cone from picking up the rope in question, which is not even fished in this country. But with complicated issues like this, the goal is just to flood the airwaves with the usual talking points and hope the average person doesn't dig in to see how off-base the assumptions are. 
But in light of what I was just talking about with the necropsies, for all we know, snow cones problems could have originated with a damaged inner ear or something like that. We don't know her condition, and likewise we don't know that the entanglement of this whale off the Carolina coast wasn't precipitated by some sort of inner ear injury, which might have even been suffered during this very same round of seismic surveying that's racking up the bodies in the New Jersey and Maryland areas. As the body count rises, I expect that the malignant big money players in the ENGO space that claim to be all about saving whales will continue to largely deflect attention from these deaths and just keep harping on the extinction via entanglement narrative like they have been for years. And they'll certainly raise a pile of money off of the six year reprieve while I'm sure doing their best to get it overturned well before it's set to expire. I think they're going to be under increasing pressure to produce entanglement sightings, even if they have to settle for redundant ones like their golden goose, Snow Cone. And it's terrific that there are some environmental NGOs out there operating with integrity and looking to hold the actual culprits of whale deaths responsible. And Clean Ocean Action seems to be doing an excellent job leading the charge on this effort. They've really been organizing to get the word out on this story and to inspire the feds to course correct on their relentless pursuit of filling the oceans with wind farms. COA is advocating for three steps of action. The first, a thorough, transparent investigation of these whale deaths performed by federal agencies with independent, third-party scientist oversight. The public must have access to all reports from the investigation every step of the way. I don't see how anyone could argue with that. Second, a hard stop to all current in-water activity by the offshore wind industry until the investigation is complete. Which makes sense. If this offshore wind activity is what's causing these whale deaths, should probably stop that. And a hard stop to all new, pending, or planned offshore wind projects. Which they mention are already at the moment, at this very moment, totaling over a million acres of the ocean, permitted or planned, for offshore wind construction at this time. 